Good morning, Linda. Good morning, Madison. How are you both? Good morning. Good. Doing Thank well. You Thank us. you. Yeah, finally got to do this. We've uh, how long ago was it you reached out to me? Uh probably back in January, I think. Okay, so it's been a while, it's been but a while. Uh, I knew I wanted to do it in person. We prefer to do interviews in person because yeah, it's uh, it's better to sit and have a, a, a closer relationship with somebody to to understand the things they're talking about over Zoom. We find it's a bit rubbish. Um, but why did you reach out to me? Um, I am a big fan of Bitcoin, and I see the future that it holds and what it could do for everyone, but especially our survivors. And I'm trying to grow that part of our business so we can educate people on Bitcoin and how to use it and how to get financially ahead and empower yourself to have control over your financials, um, but also to raise money and just to create awareness. And who orange pilled you? Um, my dad, Josh Fix. He works at River. Um, but it was a few years ago where he was talking about it, talking about it. And then when I really bought in is he showed me um, one website where if I invested five years ago, where would it be now? And I was like, whoa. Whoa. So that's when I bought in and then I started educating myself. And then it kind of just naturally followed and I'm in love with it. I think it's awesome. Amazing. And uh one day you knocked on Linda's door and said, I need to talk to you about this Bitcoin thing. Yes. And yeah. you were like, what, what do you want about? She, she <laughs> came to me and, you know, ancillarily I'd heard, but I wasn't really involved. And certainly as a nonprofit, when it comes to donors and things, you want to diversify, right? You want to be able to give things for the long term. And she came to me and said, so what if we take in Bitcoin donations and I said, how are we even going to do that? We're not set up to do any of this. I have no idea. And she's like, just trust me and I'll um, I'll take care of it and we'll figure it out. And she's done a great job and really helped us understand the importance of it, but also maybe some long-term um, long term points for our survivors and helping them understand because one of the things that we really want to focus on is their financial stability. Mm -hmm. And the market right now for anyone that is social, everyone really, it doesn't matter whether you have a social economic uh, situation or not, is terrible. Um, you know, finding money to buy a house, it's very much mired in a traditional system of um, you have credit, you have a person, you have you know, a percentage of dollars, and then you can buy into a life that um, everyone else has. And unfortunately, because of the nature of the survivors and what they've been through, it takes them much longer to buy into the life. We will cover all of that. Um, did you did you go to the Bitcoin Nerd Fest last week? I did not. You I did was. Not. I did not. We had our major event last week. You had yours. We had our major event last week. Did it so go well? It went very well. Okay. I think. I think honestly, it was probably a record breaking event for us. Well, if it doesn't clash next year, we'll get you a nerd fest. Okay. You can come and meet everybody. Um, these, uh, these are some of the most important shows we make. Uh, we make a lot of shows. Uh, naturally, people want to hear about the macro economy and how Bitcoin is going to go to the moon and sometimes some of the cool technology, but it's the cool technology which uh, is available to survivors or people in the situations we're going to talk about today, which may help them. Um, one of the things that's come up in the past is, uh, particularly in the Middle East, uh, women in the Middle East have a very different mm -hmm. situation with regards to banking and their finances and who has control of it. And Bitcoin has often been touted as a technology to help. Mm -hmm. But but it's not just the Middle East where it can help people right. secure, hide funds and protect themselves. So, so we're going to get into all of that. Um, Linda, I think it's probably a good starting point just to explain the charity, who it is and what you what you do. So we are Women in Distress at Bar Broward County, and we are the Certified uh, Domestic Violence Center for Broward. Um, we serve between three to 6,000 um, survivors a year in a variety of services. We have a domestic violence shelter that has 136 beds. Um, we have an outreach center, therapy. We have a pet shelter. Um, you know, we know that survivors won't leave without their pet. Um, so we created a system for that. So we are kind of the wraparound service so that when folks are at their lowest in a domestic violence relationship, they can come to us. Um, we have been around, our 50th anniversary is coming up, so we've been around a long time. Um, and, you know, I tell people I wish I could work myself out of a job. Unfortunately, I just don't think that with human nature being what it is that that's going to happen anytime soon, but we we strive for it every day. And Madison, what's your role at the charity? I'm the Associate Director of Development, so I do the events, the the annual fund, donor relations, and like volunteer relations. Okay, great. Well, 
uh, hopefully we'll be sending people your direction as well after yeah, this. I would love that. The work you do, um, how big an issue is this are we talking about specifically here in the county? And then please try to help me understand nationwide how big an issue this is. So I will tell you that um, one in three women, it used to be one in four, one in three women and one in five men have been um, um, in a domestic violence relationship or they know someone who has been or their family member was in a domestic violence relationship. Um, For Broward County specifically, we've seen a 22% increase in domestic violence since prior to the pandemic, um, and it's just increasing. What was that number? The 22% increase. Um, You know, I think it's related to a multitude of issues, but, you know, COVID really did a number on the psyche of of people, and I don't think that we are quite quantifying that in the way we should. Um, I also think that... um, you know, being stuck in one certain area and being unable to escape that area has an impact on the the breadth of domestic violence in Broward County. Um, worldwide, domestic violence has increased by probably 15 to about the same amount, 15 to 20 percent. Um, I think some of the scarier things that we're seeing are an increase in the high lethality cases. So cases where we identify it's likely to indicate a death if someone doesn't intervene soon. We've seen an increase in deaths here in Broward County, across the nation. Um, I get a lot of phone calls from press um, about this situation. This person did something, you know, and, and killed their their um, their spouse, their family member. And we get those much more than we used to. Our crisis line takes about 15,000 calls a year, and now we're taking a call every two minutes. Um, we also cover this. Um, Women in Distress is also the holder of the hotline for the state of Florida. So in addition to our own internal hotline, we also answer the hotline for the entire state of Florida, and we're getting bombarded. Um, it's The problem is growing, and we can't seem to get a handle on – Um, lowering the numbers. So we're just doing everything we can in terms of prevention, making sure that people know we're here so when it happens, but also making sure that um, when we do get folks into a situation, into the shelter, that they have the tools they need to be sustainable. Okay, so one in three women, one in five men. We we did have the question on on men because we wanted to understand Mm -hmm. the disparity. That's a lot higher than I expected. Mm -hmm. can these situations be mutually abusive? They can be. They can be. And I tend to look at domestic violence on a spectrum. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's not every person is the same type of batter or, and that goes for women and men. And I think that maybe given time, that number is probably more equal than we realize. I think that we often socialize men that domestic violence is something they should internalize and that um, coming out and speaking out about it makes you weak. And that's not the case at all. And so I think that men are less likely to report or to come forward. Um, so I think that number may be um, higher than even than than one in five. So, you know, we do see couples that will occasionally have an altercation. For me, that is a lot different than the person who goes from um, person to person and batters every in every relationship that they're currently in. And we see a lot more of those cases than is than you you might think, um, because it's a result of something that is not related to a scuffle, right? If we're married and we have a moment and we're pushed pulled back and forth, um, you know that's a domestic issue, but that doesn't mean that necessarily that I'm a domestic abuser long term, right? We just right. It could have been a toxic situation, right? right. Whereas somebody is. Uh, it's a personality trait of theirs that they're an abusive right. person, and those folks also tend to have other charges. So, for folks that are long, that are multiple batters, that you, they might also see um, other types of assaults, uh, robbery charges, gun charges, um, drug charges. So, things that c- accompany just negative behaviors in general. Has online dating changed the patterns of this as well? Because it's potentially made it easier for. Online dating, let's be honest, it's made it easier for men to meet women. Yes. Because historically it's us who usually want to chat a lady up and it's quite a a nerve-wracking thing to do in a bar, but to swipe on a phone is quite easy. Has that uh, contributed to an increase of the problem at all? I think so. And I think part of that is, you know, we want, we still, even though it's online dating and you know that there's some inherent risk at meeting someone on a swipe, right? Um, I, I think that there's a, 
um, we don't do enough to maybe know who we're meeting or where we're meeting. And it's part of what we talk about is it revolves around like dating rules, right? So Mm -hmm. um, meet at a public place, meet here, meet there, but you don't really know enough about a person. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that's the direction of dating, right? That's Mm -hmm. where we're going. I don't think it necessarily has to be bad, but I do think that folks need to be cautious and really follow some of the early rules that, um, like the meeting in public, not going back to someone's house, not engaging in behaviors that are would be considered risky. Not that I'm bla- I would ever blame a victim, but just making safety precautions, um, just like we safety plan with survivors for their their own safety. And that, that's a that's a problem of imminent danger for somebody who maybe right. who is a uh, somebody who's immediately targeting somebody. But you also have perhaps narcissistic people who over a certain period of time will reel somebody in and then. The pattern of abuse will start. Yeah. Um, and that happens much more frequently than the attacks. Um, you know, Florida is a transient state. So we often see folks come down here with a, um, a partner and they're following them down here for whatever reason. And then once they get them isolated and away from their family, then the abuse starts. So we, you know, we really work very hard. If you come here and this is not your home place and, you know, it's hard to live here because it's expensive. And so you get down here and, you know, you don't have something that you're passionate about. You, you may not have a, a career, right? And so you're making $15 an hour, $16 an hour. How do you live in South Florida for, you know, that kind of money with a family, with kids? So we will send you back to your support system. I would much rather send someone on a plane back to North Carolina Iowa, New York, wherever, and be surrounded by that support as opposed to stay here and flounder around and try to figure out how to make it work. And and additionally, the emotional support is something that they need as well. So is there a potential that you have people who are in a stressful situation and that's leading them to start display signs of being abusive or have abusive actions, but but they're not a, say, a, a serial criminal abuser and perhaps you can actually... Uh, if you get them into the right environment and stress-free, that may end the toxicity of that relationship. And I I'm agree. not approving of what any no, negative no. actions, but is that? No, there absolutely is. And yeah. we don't, we understand that in a lot of p- cases, especially with kiddos, you want to make sure you're, tr- you want to keep the family unit together. There. Both the parents want to stay together in some cases, but the relationship has just become, to your point, toxic. So there are interventions that we have. In fact, one of the things we're working with down here is trying to um, look at different programs for folks that are in that situation because people don't batter. The old kind of methodology was men batter specifically, and it used to be just men. Men batter because of the patriarchy. So we raise men to batter, um, and so we have to stop the patriarchy. Well, that's I don't really believe that to be true. I think that just like other parts of your life, people do things because of their social environment, their upbringing, the nature, nurture. There's a everything pours into a person. So to pinpoint it and say, well, society is the reason why we create batterers is a really narrow way of looking at it. And it doesn't take into consideration all of those other factors. Like, were you a vic- were your parents um, abusive? abusive yeah. Right. So did you see that growing up? Was that a normal thing in your household? Um, what are your coping skills? And aside from seeing your parents battered, how were you, ra- what kind of, and you know, how were you raised? Were you raised in a really toxic environment? All of those things, while they, um, one thing may not be the catalyst, all of those things combined pour into the person to likely cause what's going on. So you have to take it back to what are those factors that cause you to think that this behavior is acceptable and what are the triggers for you? And then also working with both partners separately to determine, is this relationship viable? Is this something that we're going to be able to do? And then focus on the battering as this is an unacceptable practice, but how do we get you to stop, right? And so when you start working with families, uh, is there a is there a, a, a part where you're, you're eventually people are realizing actually they're being abusive? They don't realize they're being abusive. They just... They're in a relationship that's toxic. It can be one, the other, both sides. Is there a kind of like realization that you can bring people to? I think so. I think that for some batters, the behavior has gone on long enough. And, you know, physical battering isn't the only thing, right? So sometimes people are very emotional abusive, and that is sometimes harder to deal with than the physical abuse. Right. Because bruises heal, right? So 
having someone that's manipulative or someone that is toxic understand that toxicity, it sometimes it's a light bulb, right? Same thing for for victims. Some I have we have moms and other friends who bring their friends to the center and say she's in an abusive relationship and someone needs to tell her that she's abused. And you know, she's saying to them, this is normal, this is normal. So you know, victims often don't know that they're being abused either. And they come in and we kind of have a check down list that we go through with them that says, you know, are they controlling your money? Um, Are they using you, you know, sexually in a way that's not appropriate? What, you know what I mean? Like all the way through the list and by the, probably usually about three fourths of the way down the list, they get more and more quiet. They start to reflect. They're looking at whoever brought them and they're saying, you know, maybe this isn't really a good relationship for me. And, you know, I think, Realization is hard. It's hard for everyone. It's hard for us as people to realize that we've hurt someone. So that's that's really what you want is for the person who's done it to say, "This is this was bad. My behavior was unacceptable, and I'm going to do to do whatever to fix it." That questionnaire moment that reminds me. I saw a film, Never Really, Sometimes, Always. I don't know if you saw that film, mm-hmm. but it's uh, in that film he starts asking her about abuse. And uh, she, sorry, she says, and she also says, for each of these questions, can you tell me if it's never, rarely, sometimes, always? Mm-hmm. It's a very emotional scene when they work through it. And it felt like the, the word in the question was to help her realize that she's in a situation she didn't understand. That's exactly right. right? And a lot of times that it, they really don't understand. And if no. it's gone on for a really long time, or like I said, if it was a relationship that you grew up with in your household, the same applies to the victim. If you grew up in a household where your parent um, was manipulative to the other parent and and that was what you saw, that, that's what you see and you don't know that it shouldn't be continued today. It's learned right? behavior. Exactly. And with the abuse, if there's abuse towards the parent, is it often abuse towards the children or can it be separate? It can be separate. You know, I know that the Department and Children and Families, it's one of their focal points. Domestic abuse is the number one indicator for children. Um, It's the number one reason Department of Children and Families in Florida um, go out on scene is domestic abuse and secondary to that is substance abuse. So... You know, domestic abuse towards kids is is problematic for two reasons. One, it recreates a, a a generational problem, and two, you never want children to see something in the home that is negative, right? So sometimes what happens is a parent will be in a domestic abuse relationship with the with someone in the house, and they continually go back. And the Department of Children and Families looks at that as you're not able to emotionally take care of your child because you're not looking at their best interest, right? Right. And so sometimes we, and we have a group that works with those specific families because those are complicated issues, right? You're saying to someone, you're not able to take care of your kids, but in reality, I can't even, I can't even take care of myself, right? So I don't even have the, the psychological components to understand that I'm in this relationship and I shouldn't be. And um, you know, the kids end up getting stuck in the middle. Sometimes uh, the batter is not focused on the kids at all. And really the problem is really between the two adults and their inability to communicate or do whatever. And the kids are just randomly there when things are happening. Right. Okay. And so with what you do, Madison, um, what is the breakdown of support for people in abusive situations versus education? How's the mix work? I would say that's kind of split. Yeah. Um, I think we need a lot more education. I think when people think of domestic violence, it's usually negative. There's a lot of victim blaming and not understanding like the deep understanding that you need to have and that domestic violence isn't just toxic. It's about power and control. And I think that gets very mixed up in people's minds Mm -hmm. and they don't see why that goes. So with education... We're, we're getting ahead of that. So we have an education and prevention team that goes out to middle schools and high schools, and they talk about healthy dating, healthy habits. Here are boundaries. Here's what you do. And we've had kids come out of that saying, oh, my gosh, I'm abusive. We just had a, a boy say, I didn't realize I was doing this. Like, me and my girlfriend have broken up since, like, for both of our mental health, things like that. We need so much of, but then we also need the financial support for now for the people that we need to get out right now. So coercion is a big part of abuse as well. Actually, in, in the UK, that is now a crime. You can be prosecuted. There was a comedian, a leading comedian, very successful career, came out. He was very coercive towards his uh, girlfriend or wife, I can't remember. I'm not sure if he went to jail for it. Hmm. Do you remember the guy no. with the big beard? Um, 
But um, Hermes said his career was over afterwards. See, and I think that a lot of areas take um, domestic abuse much more seriously, I think, than sometimes the United States takes it. Coercive control is just now getting started in at a federal level. And we, Florida, just passed a, a law that originally started as coercive control, and now it's um, reviewing for kids in custody. But it's a huge problem. We had a... Um, it doesn't just impact the survivor, it impacts a whole system. And the UK tends to be the place that I look to for domestic, like new domestic violence um, research and things, not that we don't have that in the United States, but they just tend to your point, they've already passed a law. They tend to be a little bit ahead of um, examining these items and and really focusing in on them. Was it Justin Lee Collins? Yeah. Yeah, he got 140 hours of community service for it. Uh, so he got community mm-hmm. service, but his his career was over right. pretty much ever since. Um, and it was the first time I think I became aware of coercion as uh, as a crime. And also, it was one of those things where you read the case and you question yourself and you think, "Have I ever been like mm-hmm. this?" And you you know, it's one of those things you have to you have to think through and think about your own behavior. Um, in terms of uh, education, so back back to the children. What age is it? Uh, do you think you have to start teaching children about this? I think middle school, but I think even in elementary school, you can really drill on boundaries, you know, for child abuse too. So adults, here are your boundaries with adults, here are boundaries with kids, getting that into their head from a young mind, regardless of what they're seeing at home, what they're watching on TV or what they're around to make sure that's clear in their head. So they always have those in their minds. Okay. And here in Florida, how supportive is the state in terms of providing this education? Because look, I'm fully aware there is uh, quite a big debate in the state at the moment between what should should be taught at school and what should be taught at home. I'm aware of a particular you know, law that was passed. Um, but in terms of this, it, is it you guys fighting to have this education or the schools asking for it? And you know, what's the process of actually making it happen? So, you know, part of, it's a kind of a multi-layered problem. One, we... The state pays us a small amount of money to do primary prevention. We feel that prevention is a key component to stopping later problems. So then we go out and get private grants for our prevention program. So our our primary prevention program is one of the largest in the state. Um, We are asked by the school district to come in and talk to them about, and we, it changes every, the curriculum changes depending on the age of the kids, right? Because you don't talk to toddlers or to young, to kindergartners about domestic violence, right? You'll, that's, that's not appropriate and the parents would slay us. And as a parent, I would never want someone coming in and talking to my child about domestic violence as a kindergartner. No. But what we do talk to them about is bullying behaviors, being nice to your friends, doing those types of things, right? Which is not controversial, junior high, we start talking about dating violence. And when you start talking about dating, you start talking about all the parts of dating, not just heterosexual dating and engagements. What, why, why, why do you have to talk about the different gender parts of dating? Because um, you, need to, you need to recognize that gender plays a role in how dating um, relationships happen. And there is a huge number of um, domestic violence in the LGBTQ plus um, um, culture. Okay. And so you have to really be able to understand that culture and to speak to some of the things they're seeing to meet those kids where they're at, right? Because kids right now are coming out as non-binary. They're coming out as, um, you know, transgender. And so to ignore that and pretend that that doesn't exist or that it doesn't impact them as a person mm-hmm. is problematic because it impacts the way they engage with their peers and it impacts the, the way they engage with their relationships and those relationships are what ultimately cause them to get um, into, t- you know, power control dynamics that are not that are not good for them. Um, Do you know why there's a high level of violence within the LGBTQ community? I think it's a I think it's an insular community, okay. and I think that they. Um, you know, part of that is they spend a lot of time hiding, right, and and hiding who they are, and so. Um, Things happen in groups where that happens a lot. And I, you know, it's like anything else. I think that really it's more about keeping things private, Mm -hmm. right? Because you're afraid of someone coming in and trying to tell you what you need to do or how to manage your life or that you shouldn't be this way, right? And that's just not... 
that's that creates a whole set of systems that is problematic. And is the counter argument against discussing uh, gender that it raises ideas to kids who maybe haven't thought about this before and uh, it itself is making kids maybe question something they wouldn't have questioned otherwise? I mean, I think that's an argument that's been used for a number of things for a number of years with kids. Um, you know, if you... It's the peer pressure argument, yeah. right? You know, if if you are drinking, I need to be drinking. If you're doing drugs, I need, I'm smoking, that kind of argument. Um, I think that it's tricky because I don't think kids are going to inherently want to be transgender because their friend has said that they're transgender. And I don't, there's so much that goes into that. Mm -hmm. And there's so much stress that gets put on a person for their identity. Yeah. And I don't believe that anyone would want to put that stress on themselves just for the sake of being, for saying that I'm something, right? Of course. And I think that um, just like heterosexual relationships, we don't go out into the world and say, um, I, I never inherently thought to myself when I started dating, um, I do like boys or I do like girls or I do like this or I do like that. I was just attracted, right? You're in high school, you're attracted to your high, whoever you are in high yeah. school. And that works the same for everyone. Attraction is attraction. So to try to say that one subsection of attraction doesn't, um, is created is an interesting argument to me, but I, I believe that it's inherently part of who you grow up as, as a person. I don't believe it's something that you can put upon someone or put upon yourself because your best friend is gay or your best friend is a lesbian or, you know, whatever. I, yeah. I'm non-binary. I don't, I just don't see that. So do you as a charity provide support to transgender women? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What do you do in terms of men? Is there separate charity? Same thing. Nope. Same, oh, so you so even though you're district, you're just provide support for we, anyone. We do not turn anyone away. And okay. in fact, in our shelter, we have a um, a wing of the shelter for folks that are special. We consider special circumstances. So okay. maybe somebody that is transgender that doesn't want to be inside the normal um, shelter. Maybe a man, for instance, coming to shelter, they go into the special area because we want them to feel just as safe. Yeah as any uh, anyone else coming into shelter. And it can be a little disconcerting as a man to come into a shelter that is a majority of women. And how am I going to get the same level of service? And they do, because we don't turn anyone away. Okay, sorry, you're about to speak. And I think you said, why is it important to show DV and talk about it with different relations? And so like my friend, I have a friend who's a lesbian. Okay. And she disclosed to me that her girlfriend used to hit her. Okay, And when I looked at her like, Oh, you're saying that really normal. She, well, she didn't hurt me because you don't see it. When I look at men, I know to be afraid to some degree because I've grown up with that. I've seen it on TV and I've been taught that. But as a lesbian or a gay man or trans or anything, you're not taught what roles should look like or what it can look like. And then you're hiding. Because the tradition is men are the stronger That's sex right. and women are weaker. Women are weaker. And therefore, okay, but if there's two men, there's who is the strongest right, sex. And exactly. So people don't have a norm to relate to. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so back to the, in education then. Um, like, I don't fully understand. I've only seen the headlines uh, that don't say gay law. Right. I don't actually right. know what it is. What, what, what is it? So it basically um, says that there are certain things that cannot be taught at certain ages in the school district because of... Um, they don't want it taught in schools. They believe that parents should have the choice, okay. right, to educate their kids as it revolves around sexuality <laughs> okay. and oppression, right? And that's the other one. So, you know, one of the pushbacks was that we can't talk about oppression. Oppression is not part of um, – there is no oppression, right, in, in the United States, and there is no systematic difference between people, right? And we know that not to be true. Of we, course, yeah. We know that everyone doesn't start at the same place on the race, right? So, you know, for us as prime, as prevention, what we end up doing is, and our curriculum gets submitted to the school board, so they sign off on everything we do. We try to focus more on the relationship part of it and try to be as expansive as, as possible without violating what the state has said that they don't want, which they want these non-specific items that we can't, we can't talk about gender or gender bias. Um, we can't talk about oppression or, um, you know, really look at some of the causes because those are things that 
the movement of domestic violence was was originally started on was oppression. You know, it was originally black women that started really the domestic violence movement built out of the civil rights um, era. So to not be able to talk about that piece of it is 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 not okay to me. So we talk about it. So the so okay so. So essentially, the work you have done is now being a victim is now a victim of the culture wars and political polarization. Right. Okay. And the, we're talking to a Bitcoin community now, right. and a Bitcoin community. There are certain people in there who would fully agree with these laws, and they're in you know, they're people who are individualists. They they believe in certain things should be taught at the home. Um, uh, and I, I can see some in my head, I can picture them tutting their head and saying, what's this woke bullshit? Right. But w- what would you want to say to them to help them understand and just maybe shift some of their thinking? So I think that, you know, as a parent, I can understand that. There were things that my kids at school that they grew up in that I fought back on because I really didn't believe it was their place to, to, to put that in my home. Yeah. I, I understand where they're coming from. What I would say is the individual is all individuals. And when we have to be careful not to take away one piece of something because pretty soon it's a slippery slope, right? You start to take bits and bits and bits. And now it's this particular issue, but what if that issue is something else that you particularly don't, you know, that's something that's important to you that may just continue to be eaten away at. But I I understand where they're thinking, right? It's a scary thing to have a lack of control in your children's education. And that's where they're coming from. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there are things that we are doing to mitigate some of that, just to make sure that we're not overstepping where we shouldn't overstep. I would say the other part of that, though, is that schools are for safety, right? We have Mm -hmm. to send our kids there. We know when COVID happened that child abuse and DV went up because you don't have eyes on those kids. So the kids who need to hear some of that the most – are going to be the parents that fight back the most. The kids growing up in those homes, those kids feeling awful, those kids being suicidal and not loved and not having anyone saying, this happens, this occurs, this is normal, or reach out if you need help. I think that's another really important thing that we do. How much of a role does pop culture play in shaping opinions, uh, particularly maybe young men? I think social media, man, is, I think social media, Hellscape. It has, yeah, it really has um, made our, our lives a lot more difficult. Um, you see it in different ways, but it really is, it, it's changed the way we communicate. It's changed the way kids see themselves. Um, it, I cannot even, I, it's, it's so expansive and I'm so grateful that my kids got to span before social media and after. So they got to see what happens between the two and have a life that was created outside of that. Um, because now I get to see some of the fallout of that right over the social media and the uh, um, TikToks and the, you know, that pop culture piece is huge. And especially with some groups that are more um, malleable than others or more that are not as um, engaged with each other. So if you have a household where the parents are not engaged and the kid is doing whatever and then they're on TikTok all the time and they're do th- things can get out of control, right? Um, for women also, it really highlights this idea of the idolized um, female, right? So what should I look like when I walk out of the house? Um, you know, followers, Instagram um, influencers or other influencers, right? You've got a whole financial system, a whole system built on someone coming online and t- and putting on makeup every day or someone coming online and doing a video of them. Sh- you know, to me, it can be a, a bit mind-blowing. And the kids grow up in this environment, right? So imagine what that looks like for them. Like the little boy who sells toys and now he's got his own toy line, you know, that that was created out of, you know, his kid, his parents just having him play with toys. And now he's like a multi-million dollar child. So it changes everything. It changes everything about how we see ourselves. It changes the way people see each other. And I think that if you, if you don't have a clear hat of, um, if you don't have a clear foundation of understanding reality from this, what you see on social media, it can really send you down a rabbit hole, especially when you're young. Also, one of the things I've noticed recently on uh, 
Twitter where I am is a as a pushback to more traditional roles for women and women pushing for more traditional roles. I've seen arguments and discussions around the feminist movement has led to more women going into the workplace, having an equal opportunity with, as a father to go, I think is brilliant. But also then perhaps uh, realizing too late, it's too late to build a family because you know, it's, it's hard after your 40s for a woman mm-hmm. to have a child. Whereas I think we've just seen Robert De Niro at 82 or something, just father <laughs> again. So there's, there's different pressures on men and women to create families. I obviously support the pressure for equality of opportunity for women in the workplace because I have a daughter. Um, but but this pushback I'm seeing now for more traditional roles, is that positive or is that negative? I think it's I think it's neutral. It's right. Neutral. Me me personally, I'm I believe that feminism supports whatever women want to do. So if women want to go back into the home and work at home while and someone else is the breadwinner. Okay, if you want to go out into the workforce, I, for me, equality means I don't judge your choices as a woman. I don't want you to judge my choice as a woman, and I support you in whatever those those things are that you want to do, whether it's at home or in the job. I want you to be successful. It's more about, for me, opportunity and being given the, uh, the okay, essentially, right, to do and the opportunities to do the same thing as my male counterpart and being able to be paid the same level as my male counterpart, being able to be seen as the same level as my male counterpart. And I think that having one parent in the home, regardless of who it is, is is a good a good mm-hmm. thing for kids, right? If you can afford that, hats off to you, you know? Um, I, I'm glad that I, I probably would never have been a good stay-at-home parent. I loved my children, right? But I've always been very career-focused. And so to me, being at home all day, I probably would have driven them crazy. (laughs) And they they would have said, please, mom, go find something to do, volunteer, do something. Um, But I think that it's okay for folks to want to go back to a time that was a little bit easier. And I think that is a result, or in our minds, was a little bit easier. I don't want to say that because I never lived that life. But I think it's okay to want that. And I think it's okay for people, as long as you're not pushing your value of thinking that that's the way it should be, and you're open to exploring that women can do everything, I think that's fine. Okay, I'm going to bring up someone's name that's going to trigger a lot of people. Talk about Andrew Tate. Um, My daughter's school had an assembly about him. Mm. Uh, Yeah, they had an assembly uh, to talk about the way he talks about women. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen people defend him and say, no, he's just trying to enforce traditional values. Um, And I've seen people say he's a danger to society. I mean, I I struggle to see him as a danger to society. I think he's a dick. But I'd be more interested in, I think, your opinions and his type of opinions and what he does on social media, what impact you see that may have. You know, probably a few months ago, I would have said he's a blowhard and he is just a jackass. But mm. um, I think, honestly, I don't think that he's the level of danger that some people are saying, like he's the degradation of society. I think that's an extreme for one person, unless you're in a position of a power to really be that person. I don't see that power with him. What I do see is the same thing that I see on social media, which is a subset of the population that really wanted to have their values already solidified and finding a voice in him that solidified values you already had Mm -hmm. or that you had already thought about. From a female perspective, I don't find him to be talking about traditional values. And I think anytime that you use your voice as a negative fashion against any other group of people, that's not a good way to affect change. Um, No one is going that listens to Andrew Tate is going to come to me and tell me something and I'm going to say, oh, well, you totally changed my mind because he said it, you know? Um, I think that he's, it's, the pendulum is kind of swinging back the other direction and that there's enough people saying this man is a menace and everyone just needs to stop giving him time to talk. But enough damage for some, some groups have been done in the interest of I, I want to live a life like that. I want my woman should stay in pregnant and my dinner should be on the table at five o'clock. And if she's not, then we're going to have a problem, right? 
that's not that's not positive reinforcement of traditional values. And I think that's really something that you have to make up as a, in a relationship, you have to determine that for yourself and you both have to agree with it, right? Because you both have to live with the consequences of someone staying home and someone working or two people working, or, you know, it's like any other decision. Are we having kids? Are we not, um, you know, financial, are you paying the bills? Am I paying the bills? Are we splitting the bills? You know, to me, those are all things. And I think it becomes, I think he enjoys the stir. I think he's a grifter. I think he's he's found a way to monetize being a dick. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people, you know, some people think I'm a dick, so right. that's fine. <laughs> um, and they're probably right sometimes. But I think he's monetized being a dick. He's found a niche uh, to get attention. Uh, uh, but for it just, I would normally have just ignored somebody like him. Just said, yeah, he's a dick. Yeah. Whatever. It's when my daughter came home and said, all the boys at school love Andrew Tate. Do you know him? I was like, oh, yeah. They said they all love him. They think he's hilarious. Um, And I was like, okay. So I went and did my research and I was like, oh. They think he's hilarious because they're in high school and they're high school boys. And high school boys have a tendency to think that things are hilarious in inappropriate ways because their frontal lobe is not developed. Yeah. (laughs) So I, I look at it. It's the men, the men that are older and that are now starting to like switch their switch a little bit. And really listen to what he's saying that concern me more. I think you can un, I think you can unroll some of the things that the teenage boys are saying because your daughter meeting someone like your daughter who I do not know, but I imagine is probably pretty independent and you know pretty uh, well spoken with what she will and will not tolerate. One of those boys meeting someone like her and and them realizing no woman wants to date a man walking around telling me to get my ass in the kitchen. Like, I'm no, there are very few women that are going to date someone like that. So once you come across enough women telling you to get to like hit the bricks, um, you'll start to realize that hopefully you'll start to realize that that is not a good methodology. It's not a winning strategy. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. to pick up a woman. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about the financial side. Um, how much of a role does money play in abuse? Ooh, we have a whole line of financial abuse. It plays a ton of it plays a ton because normally the abuse comes with the power dynamic of this is my money, all of our money is my money. Um, we just had a young lady that that was the majority of was financial abuse, right? Um, and. He had locked her passport. She was actually from the UK. He had locked her passport in her his safe. She couldn't get access to any of her documents, and he controlled her um, her uh, her money. Right. She got a paycheck, went into his account, and it means that when folks eventually leave, you have nothing. You're leaving with nothing, and you're making a choice. I'd rather be safe and and have nothing than continue to deal with this degradation but it just means it's like starting your life over with with no support and and nothing to to get you by you don't have any money to go to get a hotel you can't feed your kids you can't feed yourself um it makes it hard to get a job it makes it hard because how do you get around you don't have a bus pass you don't have so you have to have a way in which to to start your life, and money is the way we function. Right, and so when somebody comes to you or they come to your center, do you have a program to get them back on their feet? We do. Yeah, so it's different in every case, but we we rely on a lot of other partners for financial assistance, so housing programs, that kind of thing, and then everything is on a case-by-case basis. And then we also have an economic justice program to teach financial literacy because they're not just starting over, they're starting negative. So not only do they have no money, they probably have no credit. Abusers wreck their credit so they can't get ahead. And then they don't have credit history. They don't have employment history. Some of them are stay-at-home moms or fathers. And so you're starting way back. And then usually you don't have that knowledge because they don't want you to have that knowledge because that's how you stay there. So now you are like a baby 18-year-old starting over maybe with kids and where you should be further ahead in life and you don't know any of this. So it's so much catch up when you think that the average person doesn't really have enough financial literacy. So to get them to that point is so necessary to get them the skills and give them a hand up and not just a hand out. We don't just want to hand them money. We want to know that they know what to do with that money and that money is going to last for them, their kids and their future. It feels like for each individual person and their children, it's a big job to take them from rescuing them from abusive situation to getting them back on their feet. 
I mean, if you want to rent an apartment, it's first, last, and deposit. Yeah. Thousands of dollars. I just moved out. It was hard for me. And I was in a good position. And I had family and resources and a savings. And it's still, still catching up. So to have nothing... And that's the minimum that you need is at least $5,000 to get into maybe a good place with no credit. It's impossible. And then if you're looking at buying a house, again, no history, no credit, no anything. So you're couch hopping or you're on the streets. When you have got somebody back on their feet and independent again, is there much, is there a high level of risk that the abuser comes back? Oh, and yeah. How do you prevent that? Education and yeah. really talking to them and safety planning. You know, we safety plan with them through everything. So you're living in your house and the abuser just shows up. He hears you finally got to, got it together. And now um, here he comes with his sad song story and his, you know, wanting to move back in and everything's going to be different. And part of what we do isn't just the financial piece. When we're following them with that financial, we're shoring them up with therapy. So we're also talking to them about, you know, how do I, how do I say no? How do I how do I treat this and I can just walk away? How do I shore myself up? And you know, domestic abuse is a little bit like Stockholm syndrome in that mm. you see you see the good in that person occasionally, and it's enough that you think, well, there is a good person in there. Why does that person do this though? Right? So it's it's very cyclical. So part of the reason why it's important for them to get stable, not just financially, but but um for psychologically is so that they can undo that, that internal monologue that they're in that says, well, he was nice yesterday. So maybe this can really work when he, this has been going on for 10 years. Right. right? Okay. So it's a dual issue. So back to the financial situation, uh, you, you, is financial education something you're providing? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm reticent to say, Oh, Bitcoin fixes this, and because I don't think it does, right. I think uh, I think what you're doing fixes this, and education fixes things. But is uh, Bitcoin a potential tool for someone to be able to save money and build themselves up a, a secret savings pot that gives them a bit of freedom? I think of I think of the film Sleeping with the Enemy, the secret plan to escape from the abuser. Mm -hmm. I think can there be a secret plan? It's like if somebody understand this Bitcoin, they can hide that away. Yes. And that would be amazing because the average person, I would say, doesn't know about the wallets or cold storage or know where to look. But if we hit that in prevention and teach them and empower them to own their money, control their lives, if you have that mindset, that's hard to break right. if you can keep it. So if we do that with Bitcoin and if we taught that as an exit route or just even in a happy relationship, you should have backups. You should have things separate and safe and secure. And so much of getting out of domestic violence is regaining your control. You've gotten all your control away. So I see Bitcoin as a solution to take ownership of your life. You got it back. This is my money. This is my wallet. I'm controlling it. I'm going to learn about it. And I'm not going to let this happen again. Have you have you implemented any education programs with it yet? I We are looking for sponsors and Bitcoin partners. Okay. That's actually our next thing. Because even though right now, maybe it's not something that would be helpful for helpful for them, but they also go back. So say they got what they needed here, something happened down the line, they got back into this situation. Now they have this tool in the back of their head like, oh, I could maybe use this to get out again. Okay. Okay. Uh, how big is the charity? How many people work for it? Around 120. Here in mm -hmm. ba Broward? Broward? Broward, yes. Broward County. Um, are, are you independent just here or are you a nationwide charity? No, we are just here and independent. Okay. Um, it feels like a very expensive operation to run. It, it uh, how are you supported financially? How do you make this work? For 51% is private donations and um, private foundations, and 49% is state and federal dollars. Okay, so the, the state the state do support you? The state does give us um, about 13% of our dollars are made up of state dollars. Okay, so how can we help and how can people listening help? You know, we do take Bitcoin donations. Yeah, now. we do. Have, we do address. take those. Where um, tell tell me where to go? Um, to the website to the women in distress org. We will put that in the show notes. Okay, um, but I would also like to have someone come in and educate our survivors about Bitcoin because I think that they there would be more interest in in having those dollars set aside. 
Um, so I think that would be a, a good next step also, because I think there's a real lack of understanding. Yeah. I, th- I, I mean, I think you'll have no difficulty finding somebody. There's people here in Miami. I bet Shay would be able to help with something yeah. like that. Uh, we, if, no, if nobody does get in touch, reach out to us. We, okay. we know some people will come and help. Okay. Uh, I think you should also go to the Bitcoin meetup here okay. and talk to them. I think that would be, that would be helpful for you. Okay, and so if anyone wants more information... Womenindistress.org. Womenindistress.org. Um, if any of my questions came across dumb, I'm really sorry, but... No, um, not at all. Thank you for coming in. Uh, you're a friend of the show now. Anything we can do to help, let us know. Come to Nerdfest next year. I will. It's in Nashville. It's not going to be here in Miami. Mm. It's going to be moving to Nashville. I still think you should come, at least one of you. I mean, your dad will probably go, so maybe we'll drag you along. Um, but I appreciate you coming in. Anything you need, just reach out to me or Danny, and we'll do our best to help you. Thank you so thank much. You. you guys have been great. Thank you.